right, we are on the very bottom of Vavam at Bayes. Um, the last two words, Ve'itzterich. Uh, the Gemara is trying to explain the Psak of Rav Shimon ben Gamliel, which is how we paskin, that when it's time to read the Megillah in an Ibriyor, in a leap year, you read the Megillah and Matanos Levionim, all of those things are done in Adar Sheni, in the second Adar and not in the first Adar. And there were two Ksukim that were cited in order to support this. One is the Chol Shana Vishana. One is that you're supposed to be consistent every year, year in and year out. Just like in a non-leap year, you read the Megillah in the month that is adjacent to Pesach to make sure that you have two stories of Geula, of redemption adjacent to each other. So to in an Ibriyor, you make sure that you read the Megillah in the month that is adjacent to Nisan, which is the month of Adar Sheni. The second Pasuk that the Gemara had cited is L'Kayim Es Igeres HaPurim Hazos HaShenis to fulfill this writ of Purim a second time, which the Gemara understands to mean not a second time, but in the second month. And that teaches me you're supposed to read it in Adar Sheni. So the Gemara now says, why do I need to psukim? V'itzrich lemichtav hashenis, v'itzrich lemichtav b'chol shana v'shana. I'll tell you why. Di'i mi b'chol shana v'shana hava amina kikushyan, kamash malan hashenis. If I would have only had the first pasuk of be consistent year in and year out, well, <clears throat> we had seen a counter-argument to that from the other Tana, which is that you can argue for consistency to read it in Adarisha, just like in every year. You're supposed to read the Megillah in the month that's adjacent to Teves, meaning that Teves comes before the month of Adar, so to read it every year in Adarisha. So therefore, you need to tell me the second pasuk of Hashenis, no, read it Dafke in Adar Sheni. The Iash Me'inan Hashenis have a mina batchila barishan uva sheni kamash malan bechol shana v'shana. And if I would have only had the pasuk of to read it in the second Adar, that might have implied just that pasuk alone might have implied that I'm supposed to read it at least lechatchila read it in the first Adar and in the second Adar. Read the Megillah twice. <clears throat> because all it tells you is to read it in the second Adar. Well, maybe that means that you're supposed to read it two times, once in the first Adar, once in the second Adar. Comes along the Pasuk of Bechol Shana Vishana to tell me, no, be consistent. Just like in a non-leap year, you read it only once, so too in a leap year, you read it only once, and that once would be in the second Adar. Now, what is Rabbi Eliezer Barabiosi, who says that you're supposed to read the Megillah in the first Adar, what does he do with this pasuk of Hashenius, which implies the second Adar? Miboy leilichidur of Shmuel bar Yehuda, the Amar of Shmuel bar Yehuda, batchila kavua b'shushan ulevasof b'chol haolam kulo. That Rav Shmuel bar Yehuda had said that initially the celebration of the victory of the Jews over Haman and his cohorts was only in the city of Shushan, but eventually, later in in future years it spread to the entire world. In other words, instead of it being a local commemoration, it became a national commemoration for the international Jewish community. And that's what Shainis means, that it, it expanded from year one to year two, that historically, in the second year, it became a, a universal holiday for Klal Yisrael. And related to that, we're going to see now the next Gemaras. Amar of Shmuel bar Yehuda, Sholcha lahem Esther lachachamim, kavuuni ledoros, <clears throat> After the initial victory, Esther sends a message to the Chachamim saying, I would like you to establish me, meaning my story, should be established for all posterity for Klal Yisrael. Don't just make it a localized incident. Make this a national holiday for all of Klal Yisrael. Shalchula, kina at me'oreres aleinu levein ha'umos? Question mark. So that she, they said back to her, what are you trying to be insightful and cause there to be hatred against us, anti-Semitism you're trying to create? In other words, basically, if for us to play up the Purim story, which is all a story about how the Jews were able to exercise victory and annihilate our enemies and kill all of our enemies, is insightful. In other words, when you think about it, it's sort of basically, it's provocational. It's basically a statement of, let's celebrate the day when our enemies were destroyed. So all of the enemies are going to be provoked and they're going to want to start up with us more. We know 
that historically the Purim story has been used as an anti-Semitic canard against the Jews. So that's what Chazal were concerned about. So what was her response? Shal chalahem kivar kesuva ani al divrei hayamun malchayim adayu faras. Now that's, that's not a legitimate argument because it's already a well-publicized story. The Purim story is already well-known in the annals of Persian history. So for us to be able to, for us to celebrate it is not going to uh, have any uh, further negative effect since it's already a well-known popular story. So therefore, it's not provocational. <clears throat> All right. It's provocational elsewhere, though. It might not have been and certainly a, a couple thousand years later, yes. right, when Persian history is no longer prominent within the, within the world's consciousness. Okay, fine. But celebrating our salvation right, is not provo- provocative. It's provocative if you're celebrating someone else's downfall. Uh, that's, that's a good argument. However, the counter-argument to that is you cannot celebrate your own victory um, and be t- totally oblivious to the fact that with every victory, there's always a zero sum. With every victory comes a defeat to the other. Right. Right. One could argue the Pesach story right. is not the same. Yeah, so take a look at the Meshachachma uh, in Parshas B'Shalach, or, or Parshas Bo or B'Shalach, I don't remember anymore. But he talks about this idea of ben foloi vechal tismach. Rav, Rav, Chanina, Rav Yechanan, Rav Chaviva. Now you have the following four sages, and before we introduce you to the statement that they made, the Gemara just wants to point out to us that there's a little bit of a controversy as to whether it was Rabbi Yochanan as part of this quartet or not. That sometimes when we find this quartet of sages mentioned together, there are those who say that it wasn't Rabbi Yochanan as part of the quartet, it was, for, it was Rabbi Yonasan instead. But what did they teach? That Esther sent a message to the rabbi saying, write me for all posterity. In other words, I want my own scroll to be as part of the biblical canon, that my story should be part of the uh, official writ of the Jewish people, part of official biblical literature. Shalchula, Halokasafti Lach Shalishim, that Shlomo HaMelech wrote in the book of Mishle, no, I've already written for you three times. And the Gemara says, Shalishim Velo Ribeim, that this is a reference to the wars with Amalek. And it says that the wars with Amalek have already been written three times. And Shlomo HaMelech was implying, do not write it down a fourth time. So if there were already three mentions of the Amalekite wars, we cannot write Esther's story of, against Amalek as a fourth time. What were the three times? First in Parshas B'Shalach, when Moshe and Yehoshua go to war against Amalek. The and second time is in Parshas Kisait, say in the book of Devarim, when the Torah says, Zachor, Eis Asher Asalacha Amalek, what we read in Parshas Zachor. And the third time is the Haftorah for Parshas Zachor, which is the story of Shmuel and Shaul going against the Amalekite king Agag. So, it's already written three times. We can't write it a fourth time. At Shematzelo Mikra Kasuv Batorah. But then the, the, she, they found a support for Esther. And what was that? There's a Pasuk in the uh, Torah that says, Ksov Zos Zikaron Basefer. That Moshe tells Yehoshua, write this down as a memorial in a book. Ksov Zos, Mashukasuv Khan, Uve Mishnah Torah. So they break down the words in the Pasuk. The word Zos refers to everything that's mentioned in the Torah about Amalek, which includes both the war in Parshas Bishalach and the mitzvah of Zohar in Parshas Kiseitse. Zikaron, Mashakas of Banavim. The word Zikaron in the Pasuk is a mention of what the war with Agag between Shaul and Agag in, in Sefer Shmuel. And Basefer, Mashakas of Megillah. So we have the extra word Basefer, which implies that you should write Megillah's Esther down and canonize it. <coughs> and the Gemara now says that this is actually a Machlokas Tanoim as to whether Esther was rightfully a part of the Jewish canon of the Bible or not. Kasov Zos, Mashakasov Khan, Zikaron Mashakasov in Mishnah Torah, Basefer Mashakasov in Avim Divir Rabbi Yoshua. You see, Rabbi Yoshua has a different breakdown of the Pasuk. Instead of saying that the word Zos is inclusive of both passages in the Torah about Amalek, he says, no, it's only a reference to what is written in Parshas Bishalach. And Zikaron is the Parsha of Zachar in Parshas Kiseitse. And the word Basefer is in from Sefer Shmuel. So therefore, according to Rabbi Yehoshua, there's no room in this Pasuk to include the story of Esther as part of the biblical canon. 
And Rebbe Lazar Hamodoi Omer, Kisov Zos Mashakosov Khan, Uve Mishnah Torah, Zikaron Mashakosov Banavim, and Basefer Mashakosov in Megillah. And Rebbe Lazar Hamodoi, which is what we just cited, says no, the word Zos is a reference to Vizos HaTorah. Right? Everything that's written in the Torah, both in Parshas Bishalach and in Parshas Kiseitse, is included in the word Zos. Zikaron is, a, is the story of Shmuel and Agag. And Basefer is inclusive of the story of Megillus Esther. Amar of Yehuda Omar Shmuel, Esther ena metama es hayadayim. So in a related statement, because we're talking about whether Esther is a part of the official biblical canon or not, right? So Shmuel says that the scroll of Esther does not render the hands tummy. Now what are we talking about? Chazal at some point historically during the Bayasheni were gozer, that if you touch any biblical scripture, your hands become tummy. Now why did they do that? It's from Maseches Yadaim. They did that because people used to store their holy tithes and their sacrificial tithes. They used to store them with holy scriptures because they felt, look, the Torah is holy, our food is holy, so we'll keep them stored together. What happened? No refrigeration. You put food out. What's going to happen? Vermin. Mice. So the mice came along. They started nibbling on the food and started nibbling on the parchment too. So this meant, so the rabbis saw that this was very destructive to the, to the parchment, and they therefore said, no more. And in a way to, to cause people to no longer store their food next to Holy Scriptures, they said that if you touch the Holy Scriptures, your hands become tummy, you won't be able to handle the food anymore. So therefore, people could no longer store them together. But the scroll of Esther is not a problem because it's not part of the Bible. It's not part of Tanakh. And therefore, it's the, you know, there's no problem of it being metame the hands. Is that the connection where we don't touch the Torah today? No, that's a different reason. That's because the Chazal say that a person who touches the Torah, the parchment of the scroll, naked, in other words, without any, uh, with any, anything impeding his, his bare hands, will be buried naked, meaning naked of that mitzvah. Right? In other words, there's a certain reverence that you have to have for a Torah scroll by not touching the parchment directly. It's not it's nothing to do with the tomb over here. Okay, so the, because God's name wasn't mentioned in the Torah? No. Whether or not, the, whether or not it's Metami Yisayadayim or not, the Gemara doesn't make mention of the fact that it doesn't have Hashem's name. It's either part of the biblical canon based on whether it's written with Nevuah or not, as we'll see in just a moment. Lememra desover Shmuel Esther laf beruach hakodesh nemra. So this implies that according to Shmuel, the book of Esther was not said with divine inspiration. And that's why it's not part of the biblical canon, because there's no kedusha to the words. Frek the Gemara ve'ha'amar Shmuel Esther beruach hakodesh nemra. I, but the story of Esther is Shmuel is quoted as saying, it was said with ruach hakodesh, with divine inspiration. So the Gemara answers, nemra likros velo nemra lichtov. Shmuel acknowledges that the words of the story were prophetic in, in some way. But he just maintains that they're supposed to be recited verbatim, Baal Peh, every year. But there was never a mitzvah to incorporate it in the part of the official biblical canon. The Gemara now says, Mesme. And by the way, when I talk about canonizing, I'm, I know that I'm using Christian terminology, but that's really the best way to try and explain what's going on over here. So the Gemara now says, Mesme. Rabbi Meir Omer, Kohelis Eno Metame Yasayodayim. So let's raise a contradiction. We're going to show from this b'risa that everyone seems to be holding that Esther is part of the official biblical canon because it says that, according to Reb Meir, Koheles is a scroll that does not make the hands tame, and there's a machlokis whether Shir Hashirim makes the hands tame or not, meaning is it part of the canon or not. Rabbi Yossi Omer Shir Hashirim etame esayadayim u'machlokis b'koheles. Rabbi Yossi disagrees. He says, no, everyone agrees that Shir Hashirim is Metame Yasayadaim, and the only Machlokas is by Kohelas. Rabbi Shimon Oimer, Kohelas, Mikule Beishame, Umechumre Beisilel, Aval Rus, Vishir Hashirim, Vaester, Metame Yasayadaim. And Rabbi Shimon says, as far as this Machlokas, as far as whether Kohelas is Metame Yasayadaim, Beishamai holds that it's not. It's one of the leniencies of Shammai, who says that it's not part of, a part of the official canon, and Beisilel says it is Metame Yasayadaim. But it, everyone agrees that these three Megillas, these three scrolls, Rus, Shir Hashirim, and Esther, are Metame, the hands, because they're part of the official, a part of the official canon. So it seems like 
There is no one in this b'risa who's prepared to say that Esther is not metame hasayadayim. So how could Shmuel pr- propose this if no Tana says this? The more answer is, who da amar karebi Yehoshua? The answer is, you're right, not in that b'risa, but we saw a previous b'risa which says that Rebbe Yehoshua holds, but going back to the original pasuk of Ksob Zosi, Karan Basefer, he doesn't find room for Esther uh, that there should be a fourth mention of the Amalekite War. And according to that position, since there's no canonization possible for a fourth mention of the Amalekite War, Esther is not a part of the official biblical canon. So Tanya, Reb Shimon ben Omer, by the way, what you're seeing here is the evolution of the canonization of the Jewish Bible, right? And it's not that everyone knew immediately when these things were written down what was part of Tanakh, what was not part of Tanakh. It took centuries in order to resolve what was officially part of Tanakh and what was not part of Tanakh. So you could ask, Lamai Nafkamina, what difference does it make whether Esther is part of Tanakh or not? Well, Ramification number one is it metame as ayadayim, and number two is there kedusha to the scroll itself as far as us reading from the scroll on Purim. You see that even though there was a, an opinion that says that you should recite the story of Purim every year on Purim, the story of Esther every year on Purim, but there was an opinion that says no, you can do it baal peh because there's nothing holy intrinsically from by reading it from a Megillah, and apparently that's not how we paskin. But at least you see that there's a machlokas on the issue. So Berchus if you have to say Berchus no? Um, um, it, that it's not. Potentially, although I'm not so sure what, because the Gemara is not mitame as ayadayim, the Gemara is not right. part of the official canon, and yet you have to say Berchus when you learn a black Gemara. So I'm not sure whether you can say that. I don't think anyone would be prepared to say that if you learn the book of Esther, you don't have to say Birka Sator on it, but it's an interesting discussion. Tani Rup Shimon Benasya Omer, Kohela Seino Metame Esayadayim. So now we have the Brisa, another Brisa that says that Kohelis does not render the hands Tame, because there is no um, divine inspiration in Kohelis, but rather just mere mortal wisdom of Solomon. Right? Right? And it's a book of wisdom, which is great. It's worthwhile studying it. Just like you could study Aristotle, or you could study Ben Sira, or you could study any wise great man of previous of, of ancient history. So Amrulo Vichizu Bilvad Omar, Balok Farnemar, Vayidabir Shalosha Salof in Marshall. So the rabbis disagree. They said, Why would Shlomo only commit to writing that which is in Kohelis? After all, we know from the book of Mishlei that it records that he wrote three thousand parables. And if and if he or rather he said three thousand parables. Why did he only write down Kohelis if he had so much more wisdom? That must imply that the things that he wrote down have Ruach HaKodesh, were said with Ruach HaKodesh. The Omer, and furthermore it says, al Tosef al Devarov, that you may not add to his written uh, corpus of literature. That's also written in the book of Mishlei. So the Gemara's question is, what does that second phrase add? My Va Omer, Vichitema Mumar Meymar Tuva the answer is like this if I only had the first Pasuk which says that he said 3,000 parables that doesn't necessarily prove that Kohelis is part of the Holy Scripture that it was recited with divine inspiration because maybe it was also just words of wisdom and it was uh, indiscriminate he decided to write down things that certain things and decided not to write down other things like maybe like he didn't uh, he didn't have time to write down everything so he just wrote down some of these things and he could have written more if he wanted to and he just chose not to so therefore you need the second pasuk which implies no there was a deliberate intent of only writing these things you may not add to that which is written down because it's different from all of his other words of wisdom which is merely human aphorisms but what was written down was recited with Ruach HaKodesh Tanya, Rabbi Eliezer, Omer, Esther, Baruch HaKodesh, Nemer. The Bryson now says that Esther was recited with divine inspiration. Shenemar, Vayomer Haman Belibo. And how can I prove to you that Esther was communicated by Hashem? Because it says in the Megillah that Haman said to himself. So how can the Megillah record what Haman was thinking unless Hashem knows? No one else can read minds unless you're the Ribbon Shalom. So Rabbi Akiva, Omer, Esther, Baruch HaKodesh, Nemer, Shenemar, Vati, Esther, Nosrei, Schein, Bene, Korea. Rabbi Kiva has a different proof that it was written by God, because it says that Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. Who can testify that everyone thought Esther was beautiful, unless you're the Ribbon Shalom? Reb Meir Omer Esther Baruch Hakadosh Nemer Shenemar Vayivodah Hadavar Lamordechai. He says my proof of it is is that 
it says that Mordechai discovered the assassination plot. Who communicated that to Mordechai? It must have been Hashem. And therefore we see that Hashem is involved in the communication of the story, right? Otherwise, how would Mordechai possibly know? And Rabbi Yossi ben Dormaskis Omer, Esther Baruch HaKadosh Nemer, Shemar Uva Biza Lo Shalchu Es Yadam. Here's my proof, says Rabbi Yossi. He says that it says that when the Jews of the rest of Persia went out to war against the anti-Semites, it says that they didn't touch any of the spoils. In other words, this was a L'shem, this was a Mechemes Mitzvah, L'shem Mitzvah. It wasn't for the ex- exploiting or opportunism. And so therefore, they didn't touch any of the spoils of their enemies. Now, how does the Pasuk know that? How can you testify about every single Jew in every place in Persia unless Hashem himself would testify that? Omar Shmuel, Yavoy Hasam Hava Amina Milsa De Adifa Mikulu. Shmuel says, now Shmuel lives much later than all of these Tanoim in the Brisa. He's an Amora. He says, if I had been living at the times of the Brisa, I would have said a citation that would have been superior to all of the previous aforementioned. Shanam are Kiyamu Vikiblu. Kiyamu Lamaila Maisha Kiblu Lamata. Because the Pasuk says Kiyamu Vikiblu, which is a double verb, which seems to have no reason for being doubled. It says they established and they accepted. So why do you need both verbs to talk about the mitzvahs, mitzvahs of Purim? It's to teach you that in Shemayim, they accepted or endorsed what the Jews had accepted upon themselves down below, which means that there was a stamp of approval from, uh, from, from heaven. How can you, anyone say with authority that heaven is approved of the celebration of Purim, if not that it was recited with, with Ruach HaKodesh, there was a divine communication from Hashem that we approve. Amar Rava, lekulhu islahu pircha labar midishmul, the lesley pircha. So Rava commenting on this says, all of the tanoim of the brisa can be refuted, and I could argue that their proofs are not really proofs that Esther was said with Ruach HaKodesh. Shmuel's, however, cannot be refuted. And so he's going to show you. The Rebbe Eliezer svaruhu de lo hava inish, the chash of lamalka kavose. Vahayki kamafish tuva ve'omar, adayta denafshe ka'omar. He says, what was Rabbi Eliezer's proof? He says, it says that Haman thought to himself, right? So how, who, who do you, how do you know what Haman was thinking? So I could argue, says Rava, it's clear what, Rava, what Haman was thinking. You know why? Because what was the story over there? The king turns to Haman and he says, right, what would you do, to, uh, what would you do if you, there was a person that the king wanted to honor, right? So what would you do to that person? So Haman says, starts, starts heaping it on. He says, oh, you should get a horse, and you should get regal clothing, and you should ride the person around in the town. So why was he being so effusive in his suggestion? It must mean only an onlooker would only logically conclude that he was thinking this to himself. He, the king must be thinking about me. Otherwise, why would, he, why would he be so suggestive of excessive honor to a person that had nothing to do with him? So that's the reason why. It's not because God, you know, the person writing this was reading Haman's mind. It was because it was self-evident based on the circumstances. And the Rebbe Akiva, Dilma Karabalazar, Dhamar Malami Shikolecha Vecha, Nidimus Loku Masa. And we'll learn later on, Rebbe, what was Rebbe Akiva's proof? Because it says in the Megillah that everyone thought Esther was beautiful. Well, how do you know that? Well, we're going to see later on that Hashem made a miracle that anyone who looked at Esther thought that she was from his locale. She had a certain appearance that she had, ethnically, she looked like a multi ethnic. Mm-hmm. Like, if so, if you were. From his, if you were Hispanic, she looked Hispanic. If you were, you know, if you were Russian, she looked Russian, right? So she had this, she had this uh, international appeal. It sounds like it was a, like a miraculous thing, but the point is, is that like Rashi says, everyone who looked at her said, "Hey, she looks like one of us." So it was an onlooker would look at the circumstances and say, "If everyone is taking claim uh, for is, is claiming credit for Esther, it must mean that everyone thought she was beautiful, not because Hashem is reading someone's mind." And Vahadar Reb Meir Dilma Karabichia Bar Abba Dhamma Bixan Vasera Shnei Tarshiyam Hayu. The the what was Reb what was Rebbe um, Meir's proof? It's that Mordechai was informed. Well, how was he informed? It must have been that Hashem communicated this to him, and thus we must know that it was written with the Kodesh. Because otherwise, how would we know that Hashem what Hashem told Mordechai? Well, that's that's not a proof. Maybe we're going to see later on in the Gemara. The is going to tell us that Bigtan and Teresh were foreigners. They were from a place called Tarshish, or Tarshi, and they spoke the Tarshian language. 
and they didn't think that anyone would be able to understand them because it was a very far away place. What they neglected to realize is that Mordechai was a member of the Sanhedrin, and he, as a member of the Sanhedrin, he understood 70 different languages, and that's why he picked up their communication. So maybe that's how the author of the Megillah knows that uh, that Vayi Mordechai. Mordechai is listening, and he figured it out, not because he got divine communication. And Vahada Rabbi Yossi ben Durmaska is still not pristiki shadur. And Rabbi Yossi ben Durmaskas, who had said that how would we know that no Jew anywhere in Persia took any of the spoils unless God told us, not necessarily. Maybe letters were sent to Esther from all over Persia, attesting to the faithfulness of the Jews that we didn't touch any of the spoils. So you don't have a proof from any of the aforementioned that this was written with Ruach HaKodesh, but the Shmuel Vade Leslie Pircha. But Shmuel's proof of Kiyamu Vikiblu, why would you need two verbs unless it's referring to two different parties, one in heaven and one down here? And if that's the way you're interpreting it, then surely that's a proof. So Amar, I believe it's uh, Rava, says, Haino Da'amri Inshi, Tava Chalta Chada Palpalta Charifta, Mimoli Tsini Kari. He says, that's why there's a famous saying that people have in Aramaic. They say, one hot pepper is better than a whole basket of gourds. In other words, all you need is one spicy pepper to really get things going. Shmuel was the spicy pepper. He had the best pshat. And even though he's only one, but he was spicier than the other rabbis. Rav Yosef Omar Mehacha, Rav Yosef says, I can prove to you that Esther was with Ruach HaKodesh because it says that the days of Purim will never pass away from the Jewish people. How, who can say that prophetically unless it was said with prophecy? And Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak Omer Mehacha V'zichem lo Yosuf Mizaram. He says, no, you have to re- read the last part of the Pesach really to prove it because it says that the memory of Purim will never cease from the descendants of the Jewish people. And like Tosva speaks out, if you only had the first part of the Pesach, maybe the first part of the Pesach is only speaking about the generation of Jews that were living at the time of the miracle, that they would always celebrate it. But how do you know that it's all for all perpetuity, for all posterity? That you really need to be a Navi in order to be able to declare. And that proves to us that Esther was recited with Ruach HaKodesh. Next, to Matanos Levyonim, that the, the Mishnah had linked Matanos Levyonim to the reading of the Megillah, as we had said before. So, Tani Rav Yosef, Umishloach Manos Ishlerei Ehu. So, let's just define what the mitzvahs are. The Torah says that gift parcels in the plural, one man to his friend. So, what does that teach me? Shtei Manos Li'ishachad. That halachically, how do you fulfill Mishloach Manos? You only have to give to one person two parcels of food or two types of food. Right? That's what you see from the, from the structure of the verbiage in the Pasuk, two to one, right? But umatanos levyonim, which is gifts to the poor people, two to the, the plural poor, shte matanos lishne b'nei So the way you fulfill the mitzvah matanos levyonim is you give two meals to two poor people, meaning that each poor person gets one meal, and that's how you fulfill the mitzvah of matanos levyonim. Reb Yehuda Nesiyah Shadolei L'Reb Yehoshia Atma de Igla Tilsa V'Garva de Chamra Rabbi Yehuda Nesiya sent Rabbi Oshia um, a gift on Purim. He sent him the a, a leg of a or thigh of a roasted uh, a, a, um, a fatted calf, and he sent him a, a flask of wine. So Shalach Lei, he sent back to him Kiyamta Bano Rabenu Umishlach Manos Ishlere Ehu, and the Gra and the Bach take out the next words of Matanos Levyon. So Rabbi Oshia said, "You fulfilled your mitzvah of Mishlach Manos." The Chiddush being is that. Even though one is a beverage and one is a food, that's mishloach manos. That's you can fulfill mishloach manos with a with a flask of wine. You could also learn if you were going to disregard the gra and the bach and keep the girsa of matanos levyonim. Perhaps Rabbi Oshi was also telling him that because I'm poor, you can double up on the mitzvah and you fulfill both mishloach manos and matanos levyonim by feeding me on Purim. Now, Rabbi Shodale Lamari Bar Mar Biad Abaya Melotaska de Kasba. So the Gemara tells us a very interesting story. Rabbah wanted to give Mishloach Manos to Rav Mori, and he sent it via Abaya. And we learn from this story that when you send Mishloach Manos, you should send it using a Shaliach. And he told Abaya, please bring the following to my friend Rav Mori. Now Rav is the Rosh Hashiv at this stage in his life, and he sends him a sack full of dates and a container filled with roasted grain 
uh, or roasted uh, flour. I mean, it's grain that is roasted and then you grind it into flour. Rashi says it's very sweet. So Amar le Abaye, Hashta Amar Mari, Ichakla Amalka Lihavi, Dikula Mitzavari, Lonachis. So Abaye said, in a respectful way, but he said, Rebbe, I'm afraid that the gift that you're sending to Rav Mori is insufficient for a man of your stature. Because you used to be a farmer. If you're a regular Pashida farmer, Balabas, this is a very appropriate gift. You're taking from the produce of your field. But Rav Mori is going to say that this man who used to be a farmer now became a king, doesn't learn how to take the basket from off of his neck. Meaning that you have to upgrade you know, the way that you do things. If you're a, if you're a Rosh Hashiva now, if you have if you're if you're princely now, if you're the head of the the academy, it's pasnish for you just to send the sack of dates in a container of flour. You should send them something more more chashev. So hader shadra leihu malotaska de zangvila umalokasa de palpalta. So Rabbi said, okay. So he put together a sack of ginger and a container filled with uh, palpalta richab long peppers. So Amar Abaye Hashda Amar Mar Ana Shadri Lechulia Biu Shadri Lechurfa. So Abaye again was critical. He said, "Rebbe, sorry. You know what Rav Mari is going to say? He's going to send you a gift, and it could be that he already sent him a gift, or maybe he's going to send the gift back with me. He's going to say, why is it I'm sending him sweet things and he's sending me spicy things? What kind of message is he trying to say that he's too? He wants to be sharp against me because ginger and peppers are very spicy. So why is he sending me such spicy things?" So Amar Abaye, and so we don't know exactly what gift Rava sent with him, but whatever he sent, he sent. Now there's much depth in, 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 in Hasidus. They go through all of the stories of this daf very extensively. We just don't have time to go into all of the different commentaries. Amar Abaye, ki nafkimi beimar hava savani, ki matoi lahasam kribali shisen soi de shisen mine kidaira, and vaachli bahu shisen plugi. That, you know, Abaye says it was Purim that day. When I left my Rebbe's house, when I left Rebbe's house, I had already eaten and I was full. But what, by the time I got to Murray's house, they brought out 60 plates of 60 different uh, cooked foods and I ate 60 portions. And Ubishulo Basraisa Avukari Leitz Likedar Uboy Lemekas Tsa Basra. The last dish they brought out, the 60th dish, you would think that by that time I'm already, uh, I can't look see straight anymore. But they, it was a pot roast of some sort, of sweeted meats. And I wanted to, I was so enamored with this food, I wanted to even chew the plate afterwards. I was so, I was so like ravenous, okay? So, Amar Abaye, Haino Darmi Inshi, Kaf Anya, Velo Yada. So, he said, that's why people say, that when the poor are hungry, they don't even realize it. In other words, when you're poor, you don't realize how hungry you are because your stomach is so empty. But once your stomach gets a little full, you have to sort of pile it all in. Inami revacha lebesima shechiach. Another thing, another thing that people say is, there's always room for dessert. You always have room for more. Always room. And when you see something really, really tasty on the table, there's always room for more. Except the stomach. Which is, yeah, which is, unfortunately, some of us have that problem. <laughs> Abaya, we, our eyes bring us more food than our stomachs really should intake. Abaya bar abin, Rebbe chanina bar abin, mechal suda sayla hadadi. So these two sages used to exchange Purim sudas. And the way Rashi learns is that one year Abaya went to Rebbe chanina, and one year Rebbe chanina went to Abaya. Now, what's the point of telling us this? Um, perhaps it's to tell us that they were poor and this is the way that they could share in the expense. But we'll see a related story to this. Rava says a person is obligated to inebriate himself, a very famous statement, on Purim until he knows not the difference between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai. And as you know, the Shulchan Aruch Paskins, that the way that we fulfill this, this uh, today is by drinking a small amount of alcohol and taking a nap. Because when you're sleeping, you know not the difference between uh, cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordechai. Okay. Rabba v'Rebbe Zera of the Sudas Purim Bahadi Hadadi, if so, come Rabba Shachti la Rebbe Zera. So the famous story, they, these two sages, again, they did this practice of exchanging Purim Sudas. So one year, Rabba and Rebbe Zera were having the Purim Suda together. And as a result of the mitzvah of Chai Vinish that a man has to inebriate himself, 
So what happened was is that uh, Rabba and Reb Zayar got inebriated. Rabba gets up and wants to show his tremendous devotion to Hashem, so he takes his most beloved friend, just like Avram with Akedas Yitzchak, and goes ahead and shechts him for the sake of a korban. Lamachar boy rachmi The following morning, realizing that he's overdone it, he davens and he resurrects his friend and brings him back to life. Lashana amr leinesimar v'nabit suda sporim ba'adi hadadi. The next year, Rabbi said, so we're going to get together in my house again this year. <laughs> so Amar Lei, lo b'chol shaita v'shaita misrachish nisa. Reb Zeyra demurred, and he said, you know what, miracles don't happen all the time. So uh, thank you, but uh, I'll, I'll be okay. I'll be okay this year on my own. Amar, now, of course, there's much greater depth. Does it probably did, did not happen literally the way the Gemara is describing it? Um, I shouldn't say probably. There's one way of understanding is that this is not to be taken literally, but that it has a much greater depth than as far as what it means to shecht somebody else, mm-hmm. to exploit someone else for, the, for your own religious devotion or service. There's a number of different ways of interpreting this. Mm-hmm. That if a person eats his Purim Suda at the night of Purim, he does not fulfill his obligation. My time a yemei mishta v'simcha ksiv, because the pasuk says they have they are days of celebration, which implies the celebration has to be during the daytime. Uh, and the post can say that nevertheless there's a small aspect of suuda at night. So you're supposed to have something celebratory at night, even though during the day is the mitzvah of the suda. Ravashi have a yosef kamei de ameimar naga v'loasu rabbanon. So Ravashi was once sitting in front of a meimar. It started to get, it was Purim day, it starts to get dark, and they're sitting in the base medrash alone, and the Talmidim are not coming to the base medrash for sheer. So Amar lay, my time, Allah Rabbonah. So Amemar says, why are the rabbis not coming? Why are the Talmidim not, uh, not coming? So Amar lay, Dilma Tridi, Besudas Purim. So the other said, well, maybe they're just uh, eating their suda today, so that, uh, you know, they're Osek the mitzvah. So Amar lay, Velohava Efshala Mechla Bortis, he said back to him, So why couldn't they eat it last night? They could spend the whole day learning today. So Amar lay, Lo Shamia Le Lamar, Hada Amar Rabba Sudas Purim Shachla Balaila Yatsa Yede Chavaso. Didn't Rebbe, didn't you ever hear the Psak of Rava? He says that if you uh, that if you uh, eat the suit at night, you're not Yotse, so therefore they only were able to eat the suda today. So Amar lay, Lo Shamia Le. So he said, you're right, and I never heard that psaq, but so therefore he wanted to make sure that he understood it properly. So Amemar studied it, or made sure, made Rav, Ravashi repeat it 40 times until he got it really, really clear, and it was like it was in his pocket. Meaning that he, in other words, this is something that, obviously there's more depth here. Why did he need it to be repeated 40 times? I could tell it to you once and you would get it, right? You can't be Yodse the Suda at night. So obviously there's more depth here. Why only during the day? Why not at night? What is the message of night versus day? Okay, we don't have time, but there's, there's, there's so much depth here. Mm-hmm. Next Mishnah. Ein ben yom tov nefesh bilvat. This is an abbreviated discussion of something which is much uh, much deeper, which is discussed in Maseches Beitzah, and, and we've learned about it also in other Masechtas as well. The only difference between yom tov and Shabbos is the law of that on Yantif you're allowed to prepare food and on uh, do malacha for food preparation, and on Shabbos you're not allowed to. Here we're not getting into the penalty, because obviously the penalties for Shabbos violation and the violation are different also, but here we're only discussing what actions are permitted or prohibited on Yantif and Shabbos versus Shabbos. So the Gemara now points out, Hala inin machshiri yoichel nefesh, zeve ze we, we see that the only thing that is permitted on Yantif is malachas of ochel nefesh that are directly related to food preparation. But preparatory acts, such as, let's say, sharpening a knife that you need for shechita, or doing other things like to prepare an oven or things like that, those are not permitted on Yantif according to everyone. Masnis and Deloka Reb Yehuda, so our Mishnah is not like Reb Yehuda, the Tanya, Ein ben Yantif l'shabas el ochel nefesh, and Reb Yehuda matir af machshiri ochel nefesh. This is a machlokas. The Chachamim say that on Yantif you can only do acts of ochel nefesh, and Reb Yehuda says you can even do machshiri ochel nefesh, preparatory acts that are needed in order to, to prepare the food. My time at the Tanakama, what's the reason of the Tanakama that you're only permitted to do ochel nefesh? Because Omar Kra, hu velo machshira. Because the Torah says, ach asheri ochel of chol nefesh, hu levado ye aselachem. Only things that are permitted for ochel nefesh may be done for you. 
And the word who is a miyot. It's coming to exclude. What is it coming to exclude? That you're not allowed to do machshirin, preparatory acts. The Reb Yehuda, lachem, lachem lechol tzarcheichem. He, has, he says there's another word in the Pasuk that says lachem, that it's for you. And lachem implies that you can do anything that you need for yourselves. And therefore, that's an inclusive phrase, and therefore that it comes to include machshiri yechel nefesh as well. V'idach nami haksiv lachem, lachem velo lovdei kolchavim, lachem velo liklavim. What's Rabbi Yehuda going to do with that inclusive, or, or what's the Chacham going to do with that inclusive clause of Lachem? They say it's not, it's not an inclusive clause. That's also an exclusive clause. It's coming to say that you're only allowed to do Eichel Nefesh for you, but not for non Jews and not for animals. So, what is Rabbi Yehuda going to do with the exclusive clause of Hu, which seems to exclude Machshire Eichel Nefesh? So, the Gemara, he'll say to you like this Ksiv Hu, Ksiv Lachem. You have an inclusive clause of lachem. You have an exclusive clause of who. So how do you reconcile it? So the answer is like this. There are two types of machshir yechel nefesh, of preparatory acts. One is a preparatory act that could have been done before yantov and you're just negligent. That the Torah does not allow you to do. But if, let's say, there's a preparatory act to cooking that you weren't able to do before Yantif, let's say, for example, your knives were sharpened before Yantif, and something happened, and the knife got dull on Yantif itself. So even though that's machshir, and that's only a preparatory act, Rabbi Huda says that the word lachem tells you that you're allowed to do it nonetheless. Okay, let's go on to the next mission. Ein ben Shabbos liyom ha-kipurim ela shezezedono bidei adam bezezedono bikares. The only difference between Shabbos and Yom Kippur, and here we're talking about the penalty, because the, that, the malacha actions that you are prohibited from doing are the same on Yom, Tif, on Yom Kippur and Shabbos. So here we're talking about the penalty, that the penalty for Shabbos violation is by a, is by a mortal court, you get executed, and the penalty for Yom Kippur violation is by the hands of heaven, that you get kares, you get spiritual excommunication. So the Gemara says, It seems like for the laws of restitution that the two are the same. Now what do we mean by restitution? There's a law in Hilcha Shabbos that says that if I do a malacha, and while I'm doing that malacha, I damage someone else's property, so we normally say the principle of Kim Lebi that that the, since I'm getting executed, I don't have to pay any lesser penalties. So therefore I'm off the hook for paying damages to the other guy. So if, let's say, I, I ignite a fire that burns down someone's field, since I'm getting executed for burning, I don't have to pay him for damages for burning down his field. So it seems like the mission is not making any distinct distinction between Shabbos and Yom Kippur as far as the laws of restitution. The same applies by Yom Kippur. So money must nisan Rabbi Nechunia ben Akanahi. The Tanya Rabbi Nechunia ben Akanahi yaosis Yom Kippurim keShabbos leTashlumin. Ma Shabbos mischayev ben Avshu potim in Tashlumin. Av Yom Kippurim mischayev ben Avshu potim in Tashlumin. That's exactly what Rabbi Nechunia ben Akanah said. That even though the penalty for Yom Kippur violation is kares. Nevertheless, it has the same din as Shabbos that if in the act of violating Yom Kippur I damage someone else's property, I'm also going to be off the hook just like I am for Shabbos. Tanan Hassan, now take a look at the Mishnah. Kol chayove krisus shalaku nifteru midei krisasen. Shenemar v'nikla achicha le'inecha kevin shalaka hareiku ki achicha dibre rabbi chananya ben gamliel. So this Mishnah says that even though a person may be liable for kares, Let's say the Basin jumps the gun, and instead of waiting for Hashem to punish this guy, they give this guy malchus, they give him lashes. Once he gets lashes, Hashem won't punish him anymore uh, in heaven. And how do you know this? Because the Torah, when it talks about malchus, it says that your brother shall be humiliated in, in, in front of you. And so once you see that he's been humiliated by getting lashes, the Torah calls him your brother. So therefore, he's not disenfranchised from Hashem anymore. And therefore, he's not going to get kares. So, Amr Rabbi Yechanan, Chalukan Olav Chavir, or Rabbi Chanani ben Gamliel. And Rabbi Yechanan says that the Chachamim disagree with him. The Chachamim say no, that even though you get Malkus, you're still going to get punished by Hashem. Amar Rava, Amri Bey Rav, Tanina, Ein Be Yom HaKippurim L'Shabbos, Ela Shezeza Dono Bidei Adam, Vezeza Dono Bihi Kares. So now he says, let's take a look at the Mishnah. Our Mishnah says that the only difference between Yom Kippur and Shabbos is that Shabbos is punishable by a mortal court, and Yom Kippur is punishable by a heavenly court. Now, the Im Isa, and if, according to, uh, but according to Rabbi Hananya, 
Idi v'idi bide adam hu. Yom Kippur is also punishable by a mortal court because if you get lashes, then you've received your, your punishment. So how can the Mishnah make this distinction? So Amar of Nachman, Hamani Rabbi Yitzchaki, the Amar Malkus Bechai Krisus Leka. It goes according to Rabbi Yitzchak. Rabbi Yitzchak is the person who disagrees with Rabbi Hananiah, and he says that no, even if you get Malkus, it doesn't let you off the hook from the Kares. And that's what our Mishnah holds like, that Kares is Kares and Malkus is Malkus, and there, you, you can't get Malkus as a way of getting you off of your Yom Kippur violation. The Tanya Rabbi Yitzchak Oimer, Chayove Krisus Bechlal Hayu, Velama Yotzes Kares, Baachoso, Laduno Bechares, Veloba Malkus. And the elaboration of that idea, which we won't have time to go into right now, is the Torah, when it talks about all of the toevas, all of the abominations in uh, Leviticus chapter 18, it says at the end that anyone who does any of these acts will get cut off from Hashem, will get kares. Later in Leviticus 20, it goes into detail about what the penalty is for each and every person separately. And the question that the Gemara undertakes in another place is, why was it necessary to itemize each and every one if the Torah already gave a general sweeping uh, law that anyone who does any of these things gets kares? So the Gemara goes through why you needed to itemize each and every one separately. And when it gets to lying with your sister, it says the reason why the Torah had to itemize lying with your sister is one of the, as an offense separately from all the others, is to tell you that just like all of these other ones, if you, if you do them, you only get kares, and you cannot be exempted by getting malchus alone. So that's that's why I had to write achos to teach me that additional halacha. But the bottom line is, is that according to Rabbi Yitzchak, if you get malchus for an offense that is punishable by kares, you're not off the hook. So Ravashi, and that's what our Mishnah goes like. So Ravashi, Omar, no. Ravashi says, I disagree. Afilu tema rabbana. Ze'ikr z'adonu bidei adam, v'ze'ikr z'adonu bihi kares. It says Ravashi, no, even if our Mishnah goes according to Rabbi Hananya, who says that Malchus does get you off of Kares, all our Mishnah is meaning to say is the primary penalty for Shabbos is in Bastin, and the primary penalty for Yom Kippur violation is in heaven. It's not commenting on what would happen if the Bastin were to jump the gun and give you Malchus. It could very well be that you'd be off the hook. But primarily, a person is punishable with Kares for Yom Kippur, and that's the difference between Shabbos and Yom Kippur. So you don't have a proof one way or the other from our Mishnah. Have a wonderful Shabbos.